Hey everyone. Okay, so we're back, and we're just gonna start exactly where I left off. Newspaper publishers who shape the presentation of hard news, supposed objective fact, often share the interests of corporations. Sorry about the dog. Filmmakers and book publishers are freest from interference, yet even before writers start to draft a work, long before it is distributed to the public, they know what they cannot say. Some people in the West scorned writers in Eastern European countries, where censorship was open and heavy, for colluding with the government to produce acceptable art. Yet self-censorship is even more insidious. Restraints have been internalized and writers may not be aware they are censoring themselves. Most do not even think about writing what they know will not be published. It takes an extraordinary, cur extraordinarily courageous and assured writer to dissent without legitimation by a political movement. In the United States, since the emergence of the civil rights and feminist movements, blacks, feminists, and gay people can write or make art containing taboo material if they're willing to distribute it themselves, selling Xerox copies from sidewalk push carts, which many do, live in poverty, which most writers do anyway, and give up hope for a larger reputation. No secret police will descend to imprison the authors of such samizdat underground self-published books. But even mass market black magazines modify or launder the dissenting or revolutionary ideas of black thinkers. To spread their ideas, feminists must maintain their own journals. Their work never appears undistorted in the major media. Lesbians have opened their own publishing houses. An individual has the freedom to work in comparative obscurity and poverty in order to write freely, but with a few exceptions, his or her ideas do not penetrate the larger culture. America's ruling class has found a solution to the problem of freedom of expression. It is not necessary to maintain a KGB and gulags when you can simply keep dissenting ideas from being widely diffused. Therefore, it is easiest to discover a society's taboos by looking at the most popular media. A thorough analysis of the attitudes being promoted or censored in film or television would require a book to itself. But two recent articles on the reborn Ms. Magazine exposed the effect of corporate power on women's magazines. Ms. was never radical. It carefully avoided male bashing and limited its political agenda to empowering women. It informed women as no other women's magazine did about their own bodies, emotions, activities, and accomplishments, and never challenged capitalist notions beyond refusing to present women as commodities for male purchase. But even that was too much for the male establishment that controls all the money and the advertising on which magazines depend for their life. All magazines are to some degree controlled by advertisers. Even supposedly independent news magazines use soft cover stories to sell ads, all censor articles that might disturb big advertisers or the government. Peggy Ornstein observes that many advertisers, terrified of controversy, avoid political magazines like Mother Jones, The Nation, Harper's, and The Atlantic, which need private contributions to stay afloat. Women's magazines generally cannot attract such private backing because few women have money. And Gloria Steinem writes, Advertisers exert terrific pressure on women's magazines, dictating or at least guiding almost their entire content. Makers of products for women require women's magazines, called cash cows in the trade, to print receipts, recipes, and articles on beauty and fashion to highlight their ads, and further to promote a certain kind of beauty, food, and fashion, the accoutrements of women as commodity. Leonard Lauder refuses to place ads for Estee Lauder products in Ms. because he told Steinem Estee Lauder was selling a kept woman mentality. They got it. Sino protested that 60% of his customers work for wages and resemble Ms. Readers. He was unmoved. He knew he knows his customers, he said, and they would like to be kept woman. Ms. did receive a little advertising from Clairol until it mentioned a congressional hearing on chemicals used in hair dyes, which, absorbed through the skin, may be carcinogenic. Although newspapers also reported on this hearing, Clairol removed its ads from Ms. It also changed its formula. 
Learning that four women in the Soviet Union who produced feminist samizdat had been exiled, feminist ideas considered dissent, were illegal in the Soviet Union. The Ms. editors solicited contributions to Robert Mor so Robert Morgan could go to Vienna to interview them. The cover story Morgan wrote, Steinem recalls, was a coup offering the first news of a populist peace movement in Afghanistan, a prediction of glasnost, and an intimate glimpse of Soviet women's lives. It won a front page award, but it lost the magazine one of its few advertisers. Revlon withdrew its ads because the Soviet women pictured on the cover were not wearing makeup. Many advertisers avoid women's magazines entirely, fearing that a product that becomes associated with women will be devalued for men. When Steinem visited a trade fair to drum up advertising, she found VCR manufacturers demonstrating their product with pornographic videos. Some advertisers felt an irrational hatred for Ms. A food producer made reservations for dinner with the Ms. editors at an expensive restaurant they could not afford, sat through their pitch, and after dinner threw the magazine on the table and said, I wouldn't advertise in this fucking piece of shit if it were the last magazine on earth. A publisher of other women's magazines visited advertisers seeking ads and gratuitously urged them not to put ads in that dyke magazine. The story has, so far, a happy ending. Ms. is publishing again in a new format, without advertising, depending on subscriptions alone. But as editor's experience demonstrates the double standard in the magazine world, advertisers demand more control over women's magazines than over men's magazines or other publications, Steinem writes. They stipulate that ads be placed next to compatible material or that they be not appear near controversial features. Among the issues they consider controversial are sickness, large body size, or disillusionment. Women must be happy all the time. Procter & Gamble, a giant conglomerate and major advertiser, stipulated that its products not be advertised in any issue that mentioned gun control, abortion, the occult, or cults, or that disparage religion. Is this censorship? To be assured of advertising revenue, women's magazines must be vapid, contentless. Steinem chose random issues from early 1990 and counted the pages of actual content, including even letters to the editor and horoscopes versus pages of ads and complimentary copy, articles written to advertisers' specifications. She found that the April Glamour had 65 pages of real copy out of 339, May Vogue 38 pages of copy out of 319, April Red Book 44 out of 173, March Family Circle 33 out of 180, May L 39 out of 326, and November 1989 Lears 65 out of 173. Underlying advertisers' constraints is the fear shared by the male establishment generally that women with a stronger self-image might no longer be willing to remain a servant class, might even unite against exploitation. To keep a group subordinate, an elite must persuade it that it deserves subordination because of innate inferiorities. A person or an inferior group cannot be the author of his or, of his or her own life, but must center on the superior group. Thus, women must be presented as mainly sexual, indeed heterosexual, beings who have no life apart from men. And it is essential that a subordinated group not perceive its dominators as oppressors. The primary taboo forbids portraying men as a caste as responsible for women's problems. If one man appears as a woman's oppressor, another must appear as her savior. When this taboo is broken, men protest. Consider, for instance, male reaction to the female buddy film Thelma and Louise. Most male characters in this film are unexceptional. Men most women are familiar with, a selfish, contemptuous husband, an uncommitted lover, a predatory rapist, a predatory truck driver. Two are unlikely, a sexy thief and a sympathetic police officer. Except for a Rastafarian with a sense of humor who never meets them, all the men exploit the female heroes in some way. But the film is not primarily concerned with men, it focuses on the women as oppressed human beings who liberate themselves joyously. Thelma and Louise take violent revenge on the predatory men, but the film contains much less violence than almost any male film these days. Only one person is murdered, but Thelma and Louise is radical. It breaks two major taboos. It shows men at, w at war on women, and women retaliating against men. It is more realistic than films about violent men, who are always reabsorbed into the community, if sometimes as marginal figures. But retaliating turns women into outlaws. Women's real identity in a male supremacist world, 
according to writers like Flora Tristan, Mary Wollstonecraft, and Virginia Woolf, and makes it impossible for them to go on living in such a world. Yet it is an outlaw role that they discover themselves. The film addresses human liberation, and at the showing I attended, men as well as women were exhilarated by the heroine's discovery of freedom. But other men were outraged by this film. Ralph Novak in People magazine wrote, any movie that went as far out of its way to trash women as this female chauvinist sow of a film does to trash men. Sheba. Oh, damn, the window's open. Like, the screen's open. Would be universally and justifiably condemned. He calls its male director a gender quizzling, tacitly acknowledging the existence of a sex war. Times... Richard Schickel allows others to bear the onus of condemnation, opening his review with this sentence, emphasis mine. It is the first movie I've ever seen which told the downright, downright truth, says Mary Lucy, a lesbian activist in Los Angeles. Schickel quotes John Leo of U.S. News and World Report. It is a peon to transformative violence, an explicit fascist theme. I don't know how to browse the word faces, fascist, faces, fascist. And R Richard Johnson in the New York Daily News. It justifies armed robbery, manslaughter, and chronic drunk driving. Considering the acts male movies justify, one can only laugh. Despite its considerable success, the movie has endured a chorus of condemnation, hard for anyone to bear, and the movie's courageous writer, Callie Curry, will need even more courage to write anything so female again and other female writers know that the battle lines have been drawn. The taboo on portraying the real sexual power relations in society affects all cultural forms to some degree. For instance, many published works contain hideous fictional male violence toward women, but it is hard to publish a book that discusses actual male violence toward women. There is little market for books on battering or rape. The cultural establishment is in the position of refusing to hinder the diffusion of works depicting male sadism toward women, on grounds a bar would be censorship, while hindering the diffusion of those depicting male oppression of women on grounds of the market. This situation clearly has to do with sexual politics, not freedom of expression. There are taboos on the cultural presentation of other groups and situations. Taboos on the depiction of black men, for example, resemble those on women for similar reasons, but some taboos work to benefit society. Anti-Semitism is not unknown in the United States, and some people consider it acceptable to hate Jews, but no film or television drama could show an approving attitude toward anti-Semitic acts. Producers self-censor such material, as they should. Hatred of any group for its identity is evil. It is a moral imperative to show it as an evil. If the real dimensions of white persecution of blacks, especially in the economic realm, never appear in popular culture, Neither does it focus gloatingly on the rape, mutilation, and murder of blacks, yet popular works do dwell lovingly on the rape, mutilation, and murder of women. People disagree about morality, but certain acts are so blatantly cruel and evil that almost every human being finds them repugnant. Is not hatred and violent abuse of women such an evil? Why is it permitted to be portrayed? The opponents of the anti-pornography feminists demand proof that pornographic works foster or inspire male violence against women. But the intersection of culture and life is not quantifiable or provable. One cannot prove that violence against women in pornography leads to violence against women in life any more than one can prove that the disparagement of blacks and Jews pervasive in 19th century culture caused the horrors of African colonialism and the Holocaust. The mere suspicion of a connection is considered sufficient reason to refuse to legitimate hatred of groups. Only when it comes to women does our culture suspend this restraint. Many films and television shows are produced by men for men. Their main purposes are to show white males triumphant, to teach gender roles, and to cater to men's delight in male predation and victimization of women, especially young, pretty, and here naked women with highly developed breasts and buttocks, parts that are usually the locus of attack. Like the men in the proto-Nazi German Freikorps that wage war between the wars, shooting women between the legs because they carried grenades there, Americans' men's most satisfying target is women's sexuality, the area of men's greatest fear. Pornography is a systemic abuse of women because the establishment colludes in this male sadism toward women, which fits its purposes. 
Case in point, the Indian government, which does censor films for political content, forbids scenes of love making or kissing, but allows rape. Indeed, a rape scene has been all but requisite in Indian films for some years, writes Anita Pratap. Since the first male leader imagined the first state, men who wanted to dominate as priests, soldiers, or both needed war to establish their supremacy. But war requires fighters and people who have not been indoctrinated into a gender cult, have not been taught that aggression equals identity, do not want to fight. To get men to fight rather than flee, male leaders had to turn them against life, identified with women, sensual pleasure, children, the growing and eating of food. Male leaders pursue the same policy today. Sexual harassment of women asserts male solidarity across class lines and divides working class men from working class women and reinforces class domination. An elite's primary need in establishing and maintaining domination is to divide men from women. Fostering male sadism promotes this division. American culture, movies, books, tel songs, television teaches men to see themselves as killers, to identify the act of murder with sex and the sex act with violent conquest. This is why so many men find it difficult to distinguish between rape and lovemaking. A new biography of J. Edgar Hoover, the power-driven FBI director, reveals that he entertained his aides with screenings of pornographic films. A news item revealed that on the nights before they bombed Iraq and the Gulf War, fighter pilots on the USS John F. Kennedy watched pornographic movies featuring sadistic male violence towards women. When an AP reporter on the ship, Neil McFarquhar, filed this story, the ship's public affairs officer censored it. Perhaps he felt it revealed a military secret. Indeed, among the most repellent examples of women hatred appear in military songs and slogans. Klaus the Willate's brilliant analysis of the sexual hatred motivating the Freikorps included a number of war songs and cartoons explicitly equating the mutilation of women with male prowess. Christopher Hitchens describes a more recent work he accidentally came across, the recreational songbook of the 77th Tactical Squadron of the U.S. Air Force, based outside Oxford, England. He was horrified by what he read and refused to print stanzas that he says were too tough for him. Here are some examples of what he did print. The Ballad of Lupe. Down in Cunt Valley where red rivers flow, where cocksuckers flourish and whoremongers grow, there lives a young maiden that I do adore. She's my hot sucking, cock sucking Mexican whore. O Lupe, O Lupe, dead in her tomb, while maggots crawl out of her decomposed womb. But the smile on her face is a mute cry for more. She's my hot sucking, cock sucking Mexican whore. Intercourse with dead women is a recurrent theme, Hitchens writes, quoting only one stanza of I fucked a dead whore. I fucked a dead whore by the roadside. I knew right away she was dead. The skin was all gone from her tummy. The hair was all gone from her head. Sadistic violence is not inherent in men's natures. It is indoctrinated in the men by a host of institutions. Government bodies do not merely tolerate male sexual sadism against women. They foster and endorse it in every male-dominated culture in the world. That's the end of part three. Part four, men's personal war against women. From boyhood, males are bombarded with the message that real men dominate women, which means they control women's behavior and may abuse them verbally and physically. So powerful and pervasive is this formula that the appearance of manhood that a man with an equal mutual relationship with a woman may adopt a posture of dominance toward her when other men are around. Such behavior suggests men believe manhood is not inherent in a man, but depends on both the opinion of other men and the existence of a subjected person or group. Male identity is therefore extremely unstable, and this instability creates anxiety, often expressed as rage. Females have enormous power in this dynamic because the appearance of virility depends on them. Women are its center. Domination of a woman is supposed to make a man feel like a man that is superior. Still, to justify abusive treatment of women in their own minds, after all, most men love some women. Men must view them as separate species, like pigs or dogs or cows, terms often applied to women, and dominating a lowly dog or cow can hardly be very satisfying. 
The formula, superstitious at its root, achieves its goal only fleetingly, unsatisfyingly. Yet instead of abandoning this unsuccessful road to self-worth, men walk it over and over again, as if enough repetition will somehow bring them to the end. Blessed relief from self-doubt. Other men too have power in this formula. This form of self-esteem can only be achieved by being witnessed by other men, who alone can confer manhood on a man. Moreover, men cannot dominate women without maintaining solidarity against them. Even a woman who accepts the status of obedient dog or brood cow has capacities for independent thought, action, speech, and creativity that militate against easy consignment of her to inferior status. To suppress these qualities, men must ally solidly against women, creating institutions that foreclose all roles to women except breeder servanthood thrust them into and keep them in the position of subhuman inferiors. That even a united male front has never totally succeeded in keeping women silent and subordinate does not deter men from continuing in this effort either. Most men do not make policy in governments, churches, or other powerful institutions. Most men serve as dogs, bulls, or robots to their masters. A man reading this book's indictment of global economic, political, and religious policies detrimental to women may feel his sex as being maligned, believing himself innocent of any complicit complicity. Men continually remind women that they too are victims, are not responsible for government policy or economic disadvantage or war, that like women they are oppressed. This is true. I question why they do not join the feminist movement or create a parallel movement. Nonetheless, the entire system of female oppression rests on ordinary men who maintain it with a fervor and dedication to duty that any secret police force might envy. What other system can depend on almost half the population to enforce a policy daily, publicly and privately, with utter reliability? As long as some men use physical force to subjugate females, all men need not. The knowledge that some men do suffices to threaten all women. Beyond that, it is not necessary to beat up a woman to beat her down. A man can simply refuse to hire women in well-paid jobs, extract as much or more work from women than men but pay them less, or treat women disrespectfully at work or at home. He can fail to support a child he has engendered, demand the woman he loves, he lives with, wait on him like a servant. He can beat or kill the woman he claims to love. He can rape women, whether mate, acquaintance, or stranger. He can rape or sexually molest his daughters, nieces, stepchildren, or the children of a woman he claims to love. The vast majority of men in the world do one or more of the above. Most information in this section on male violence describes the situation in the United States because this data is most accessible to me. But a similar situation exists throughout the world in equal or greater severity. This, sec this section, the section is divided into two parts, daily war against women by ordinary men, economically and physically. Male violence toward women could not be as epidemic as it is without the cooperation of the entire social system the press, police, courts, legislatures, academia, welfare agencies, the professions, and other institutions. Personal violence against women is a tissue of individual acts given firm backing by entrenched institutions. Just as women's problems are circular, so is male oppression. Systemic war against women could not succeed without the cooperation of individual men, and individual men's wars, wars on women require the cooperation of the system. Individual men's economic war against women. The majority of men who leave their families do not support their children adequately or at all. Few support the wives they insisted become dependent on men. These facts have become well known in the past decade as the huge number of destitute women and children beca became a natural, national problem but a problem blamed on women.
People blame welfare mothers, not irresponsible men or the arms budget, for the inflated national budget. Yet only a tiny percentage of the national budget is devoted to welfare aid as a result of perverse national priorities. Children comprise the single largest segment of the population living in poverty. These the statistics are staggering. Judges do not order men to support their children in over 40% of cases when mothers get custody. When they do, they award them roughly 10 to $40 a week, a laughable amount considering what it costs to house, feed, clothe, provide medical care, and educate a child. Even if judges do order men to support their children, the overwhelming majority of men fail to do so. In 1985, only 25% of the 8.8 .8 million men required to pay child support paid it. Another 25% sent lesser amounts, half paid nothing at all. They simply abandoned the fruit of their bodies. Women have little recourse. At most, they can file charges against the men, have them imprisoned. Not only does this defeat their purpose, a man in jail loses his wages, but most women cannot find lawyers who will help them in suing for non-support. The innumerable single mothers unable to obtain child support have no recourse at all. Men are better off financially after divorce. Men have always been paid more than women, an inequity justified by their support of families. Yet on average in the first year after divorce, men have 42% more to spend on themselves while their families live on 73% less. Children of divorced parents are almost twice as likely to live in poverty than before. Mothers who give up their children often do so because they cannot support them. One man went so far as to declare bankruptcy to avoid paying his ex-wife anything. When Jean Ferry and Gerald Sanderfoot divorced in 1986, a Wisconsin court ordered Sanderfoot to pay Ferry alimony and child support and divided the marital property, giving him the house but ordering him to pay the debts and give Ferry $29,000. To enforce his compliance, the court gave Ferry a lien loan lien on the property for that amount. Eight months later, Sanderfoot declared bankruptcy. Ferry recalled his warning that if she divorced him, he would see to it that I got nothing, that he was going to file for bankruptcy. In 1988, a female judge accused Sanderfoot of manipulating bankruptcy law and ordered him to pay his debt to Ferry, but her judgment was overturned by an appeals court, which held that Sanderfoot had acted within the law. This case is being taken to the Supreme Court. The New York Times reported this case under the headline, Can Bankruptcy Reduce the Price of a Divorce? The headline brings the perspective of a male addressing men to a piece largely sympathetic to Ferry. Middle class whites often shrug off the statistics on female poverty, assuming such things only happen to the poor and non-white, who indeed make up a disproportionate percentage of unsupported mothers. But the majority of the destitute in the United States are white women and their children, main, many formerly middle class. At about 22 million, about 22 million today remain dependent on their husband's income. Never having worked or not in decades, they are just a man away from poverty, as the Displaced Homemakers Network in Washington, D.C. puts it. More and more judges award no fault and equitable distribution divorces with little or no alimony, thrusting middle class women into destitution. Many are still responsible for children, but 58% of displaced homemakers are over 65 with no way to support themselves. Not that having a man in the house ensures women a more equitable deal. More than half the married women with children who work outside the home do all or most of the household maintenance although surely all able-bodied persons in a household should take care of themselves in their own living space. A 1985 study showed that American men still refuse to take responsibility for themselves and their surroundings. <laughs> the only household tasks more men than women take responsibility for are yard work and home repairs. The stereotype has men handling money, but only 32% of men are pay paid the bills until 1985 when 52% did so. This study, conducted over decades, reveals that in 1965, American men worked in the household 4.6 hours a week, while women put in 27 hours. In 1975, men contributed 7 hours a week, women 21.7, and in 1985, men averaged 8.8 .8 hours a week, women 19.5. If we continue at this rate, we may expect men to share maintenance tax by 2025. 
in Eastern European countries where marketing involves queuing for almost everything. Household appliances are primitive and not everyone has them. And taking out fast food, take out fast food is non-existent. Women spend endless hours on maintenance work after their work days and most work outside the home. In Hungary, for instance, 80% of women work for wages. Men in most Eastern European countries and India and in most of Africa do no household work and take little responsibility for raising their children. It's getting dark. So I moved to really close to the window. But it probably will get really dark really soon. These statistics suggest why polls invariably show men happier than women after marriage. In 1965, women did housework 15.5 hours a week before marriage, but 31.6 after it. Men put 4.7 hours into household tasks before marriage, but 4.5 after it. This situation, too, has improved. In 1985, single women worked in the household 14.9 hours, and married women averaged 22.4 hours. Single men put in 7.9, married 11.1. Women with children under 5 have the greatest burden, averaging 22.5 hours a week of housework. Those with children over 5 average 19.9. Marilyn Waring, the author of this book, discusses a survey of recreation conducted in New Zealand that defined recreation as things people enjoy doing and become deeply involved in, hobbies, sports, social or cultural activities. Women overwhelmingly, 9 out of 10 as opposed to 5 out of 10 men, recreated themselves at home. Far more women were involved in cultural activities, men in sporting activities, but the most interesting finding was that children limited women's recreational participation to an extreme degree, but men spent more time at sporting events after the birth of their children. Housework is not entirely unpleasant. Many people, women and men, enjoy cooking an occasional meal, putting wash in the machine or straightening a closet. Some even claim to enjoy house cleaning, but it is arduous when money and space are tight, when one has young children, when one alone has to do it after putting in eight or more hours at another job. Women protest their exclusive responsibility for housework because they are overworked but also because the division of labor sets up an uneven power arrangement. The person responsible for maintenance automatically becomes a servant to the others. And since housework is unpaid, the woman serves without reward or respect. Men's expectation that women will take responsibility for maintaining them is a carryover from infancy. Women perpetuate the system out of habit and inculcate their daughters with guilt. Men enforce the system by laws or customs that force women into economic dependence on men. By the ever-present threat, she who does not care for her man, does not mother him like a baby, will lose him and his economic support. Women are subjected by fear. Men foster their own infantilization, believing it demonstrates their superiority. Yet even women's caretaking and service are not enough to keep men from being violent toward them. And beneath women's fear of losing economic support, is their fear of men's physical violence. Individual men's physical war against women. The extent of male violence against women is even more staggering than men's irresponsibility toward their children. No statistics compile all forms of male violence against women. When records are kept, they separate incidents by type, such as rape, beatings, or incest, reported to the police. Most such incidents are not reported, and harassment almost never. Women travelers in Italy have traditionally been harassed and even raped or injured. No one helped the victims. Italian men prided themselves on this behavior.
Men harass, rape, and beat women travelers in South Asia, especially India. No one offers to help the victims. Asian women are only beginning to fight back themselves. A young European woman in India, attacked by a mob of men, threw herself into the sea. Only other tourists save her from drowning. Because male attacks on women are not categorized as a class, we cannot estimate the number of women physically injured by men in any given year. The statistics we have are frequently flawed, and women often do not report skirmishes in men's war against them. But in an article entitled The Global War Against Women, Lori Heisa reports that half the married men in Bangkok, Thailand regularly beat their wives. In Quito, Ecuador, 80% of all women report having been physically beaten. In Nicaragua, 44% of men admit, admit they beat their wives and girlfriends. In Papua New Guinea, wife beating is an accepted custom not worth discussing. A government minister argued during parliamentary debate over making it illegal. One parliamentarian stormed. I paid for my wife, so she should not overrule my decisions, because I am the head of the family. In Brazil, over the last 20 years, men's severe beating or murder of wives and female lovers was so common that defense of honor became a legitimate and widespread legal defense. Barbara Roberts' article, No Safe Place, The War Against Women, cites social scientist estimate that over 1.8 million husbands in the United States badly batter their wives. She also cites a survey in which 28% of couples admitted physical violence has occurred in their relationship. Researchers believe that the true rate of men ever beating a wife or female lover in the life of a relationship is closer to 50% for all couples. Roberts concludes that in the privacy of the sacred home, a war is being waged against women and adds, that so long as men are at war against women, peace for all of humankind cannot exist and there is no safe place on earth for any of us. In the United States, a man beats a woman every 12 seconds and every day four of these beatings reach their final consummation, the death of the woman. About 20% of women who report beatings by their husbands, former husbands or male lovers, have been beaten so often in the three months preceding that they cannot recall each incident distinctly. Men often threaten to kill the women they beat, although they might later claim they were speaking in the heat of the moment or under the influence. Yet until a few years ago, women could not plead self-defense if they killed their abusers, even if they killed them while the beating was going on. Another example of the legal system being used to injure women. The entire social system, including the police and courts, closes rank to protect the violent man. Policemen fear calls on domestic violence, above all, and they have guns, and do no more than end the beating momentarily. Many policemen are themselves wife beaters. In 1989, a former New York City police officer suspected of murdering his first wife was arraigned on charges of sexually abusing his 12 and 13 year old stepdaughters and raping one of them. Madeline Diaz, accused of murdering a husband who had regularly beaten, threatened, and tortured her, was asked why she did not go to the police. He was the police, she replied. Battered women have almost no recourse. Many men and women blamed the women whose husbands beat them, asking why they did not leave their abuser. But even if a woman has enough money to leave and some place to go, there is no escape from a man obsessed. You can move, you can hide, you can change your name, but they follow. They are obsessed. They have turned a woman into the cause of all their problems or an answer to them. Almost every day a man kills a woman who has left him for beating her, who has struggled within the system, getting a court order and joining him from approaching her. He also often kills her children and anyone else who happens to be near her at the time, a mother, sister, friend, and sometimes himself. Indeed, Department of Justice statistics show that 75% of reported assaults against wives or lovers are committed after separation. We believe we live in an enlightened time, but the situation for battered women reminds me of a woman's situation in Japan after about the 12th century. A Japanese wife could escape an intolerable marriage only by fleeing to a temple that gave women sanctuary. There were few, and it might be hard for a woman to reach one, and she would have to abandon her children. Escape had to be well planned, for if a husband's ser servants caught her before she reached sanctuary, she was dragged back. Common law came to hold that if a woman managed to throw her shoe through the gate, she would not be forcibly returned home. Battered women today have women's shelters for sanctuary, but they are few and endangered. If conservatives had their way, even their small state subsidies would be stopped.
So powerful and pervasive is the taboo against blaming men as a class in our society that even social scientists who deplore male violence against women perpetuate a sense of male blamelessness for these acts. Male language generally, the language used by those who work in military, engineering, computer, and as or and or other masculine enterprises, is characterized by a lack of agency. Like the nuclear strategy and analysts who discussed earlier, social scientists who write about male violence toward women and whose work may be aimed at ameliorating the situation use locutions suggesting either that no one is responsible for what is happening, that things happen as it were by themselves, or that both parties are equally responsible. Sharon Lamb, who analyzes the language used in eco I academic descriptions of male violence, writes that all social scientists use the ubiquitous passive voice, which presents acts without agents, harm without guilt. When men smash women with their fists, hammers, or other heavy objects, twist their arms back, break their bones, smash their skulls, kick them, slash them with knives, shoot them, and harm them in other inventive ways, social scientists refer innocuously to domestic or spousal violence. Spousal? Lamb finds family systems theorists particularly given to conceptualizing the problem as if men and women shared responsibility for it, not as men preying on women. Can you hear the recorder? She cites a passage from a book in which the authors describe a brutal scene of a husband beating his wife over the head with a cane and whipping her arms and legs with a hose, then asks, how could a couple inflict such a situation upon one another? Like men who rape women, men who beat women claim the women provoked them and bear all or most of the responsibility for the aggression. Male social scientists are complicit in this attribution. Lamb found that men writing alone or with women were over half again as likely to write without assigning agents to actions as women who wrote alone or with other women. Indeed, assigning men responsibility for aggressive acts may keep a paper from being published in social science journals or in newspapers or magazines for that matter. It's mad dark in here. Articles naming men as agents of violent acts were so rare, Lamb did not tally them. Here are some of Lamb's examples. Acts without agents, passive voice. Black women are abused at a disproportionately higher rate than white women. Acts without agents, the violent behavior the battery, the abuse, with no reference to whose, victims without agents, battered or abused women, abused or battered wives, gender obfuscation, she may be beaten when the assailant comes calling, why do battered women remain in relationships with abusive mates? Susan Schechter who wrote a historical account of the movement to aid women whose men beat them, explained that in seeking funding from organizations willing to help the needy, activists found it politic to emphasize women's victimization and consequent psychosocial problems. By doing so, they unintentionally conferred on battered women the permanent label of helpless victim and helped generate a mental health profession claiming expertise in family violence. Schechter believes these professionals watered down their language and shifted their focus away from battered women and battering men to domestic violence from fear of alienating the men involved in funding programs. While women are less likely to be victims of violent crime than men, they are six times more likely to be harmed by an intimate. In 1991, Department of Justice statistics showed that violent crime against men had dropped about 20% between 1973 and 1987 but that violence against women remained constant. The FBI, however, found a rising incidence of rape. About two and a half million women are assaulted, raped, or robbed every year, and a quarter of these crimes are committed by their relatives or friends. 
Only 4% of violent crimes against men are committed by female relatives or women they have dated. The United States has one of the highest, if not the highest, rate of rape in the world, con counting only those that are reported. The National Crime Survey, conducted annually by the Census Bureau, found twice as many actual rapes as were reported to the police. Women are reluctant to report rape committed by intimates, husbands, marital rape, boyfriends, date rape, and relatives, incest. It is especially difficult to counter men's sense that rape is legitimate, that it is their right. Both sexes are raised in a culture that until recently implicitly reinforced this idea. Rape within marriage or on a date was considered impossible. Rape by a stranger was the victim's fault. She was out alone. Hebrew, whore. She who goes out of the house. She was wearing the wrong clothes or shoes. She had a drink. Indeed, two recent studies of men who had committed rape demonstrate that men who rape, even those convicted of rape, a tiny minority, overwhelmingly excuse or justify the act. Diana Scully interviewed in depth convicted rapists in prison. She found they fell into two categories, which she labeled admitters or deniers. Neither took responsibility for their act, but admitters acknowledged that rape was wrong. They excused their own performance of it on grounds that they were not fully responsible. They were drinking or taking drugs. The woman had led them on. Their versions of the rape either downplayed or omitted the degree or force they had exerted. Deniers denied either that rape was wrong or that their particular performance of it was inappropriate. They acknowledged their acts but justified them by claiming the woman lured them on. The woman wanted it. She didn't resist enough. She enjoyed it. She was loose, a prostitute, or high. Deniers minimized their responsibility and revised the story from one of rape to one of seduction. Men of both types, if they were high on alcohol or drugs when they raped a woman, used this fact to excuse their violence. But if the woman was high on alcohol or drugs, they used this fact to justify their violence, claiming she was out of control. 70% of admitters, but only 40% of the deniers said substance abuse had affected their behavior. Fifty six percent of the deniers, but only fifteen percent of the admitters said the victim's behavior was affected by drugs or alcohol. Most important to our argument here, neither category felt guilt or empathy for the victims during or after the rape. Both types considered rape a low risk, high reward act. They assumed they would not be arrested, or if so, not punished. Rape was a reward, a kind of revenge, a bonus during the commission of another crime, a form of recreation or adventure. Most infuriating, given women's heart-rending guilt after a rape, their constant questioning of what they did or wore, or where they went or how they acted, that could have precipitated this action, is that all the men in this survey asked why they had chosen a particular woman, replied, it could have been any woman. Or, it didn't have to be her, she was just there at the wrong time. Peggy Reeves Sanday questioned 3,000 college women about rape. 25% said they had had unwelcome sex under men's bullying, their pressure, or arguments. 15% had come close to succumbing to threats of force, and 9% had been threatened or forced into having sex. The main focus of Sanday's investigation, however, was gang rape. Between 1982 on college campuses, 
but members of a fraternity in which a girl was gang raped said such incidents occurred once or twice a month on their campus. Sanday suggests rape is part of male socialization. Many American men are initiated into manhood by fraternity initiations during which they are brutalized and degraded, treating, treated as polluted and despised women and as pansies. Brutalization teaches them the nature of the social order and their possible place in it. They can be men or they can be women. They in turn visit their learned misogynist subjectivity on the next generation of fraternity pledges and on party women, Sande writes. These men do not consider sexual coercion rape. They call it working a yes out, talking a girl into sex or getting her high. Afterwards, they say she was asking for it. Pauline Vart reports that before the jury withdrew to deliberate in rape trials, judges commonly recited Hale's dictum. Rape is an accusation easily to be made and hard to be proved and harder to be defended by the party accused, though never so innocent. Sir Matthew Hale, 1609 to 1676, a famous British jurist, is quoted by every legal writer on rape. Only as a result of feminist efforts did judges in California stop routinely reading his instruction to juries before they deliberate. Marital rape is still legal in many states, and at least one in seven hundred seven husbands rapes his wife. Most marital rape goes unreported, like 90% of date rapes, but feminists have pressed 30 states to abolish or modify legal language, exempting men. Can you hear the piano? From prosecution for raping their wives. Some have modified the phrase, against her will, to, without her consent. In Illinois, the phrase has been eliminated, which means the prosecution no longer has to prove a woman did not consent. The defense has to prove that she agreed by word or deed. Men are currently challenging the constitutionality of marital rape laws on grounds that the term force and bodily harm are vague and too broad. We have noted several cases in which police or judges are, were unwilling to take action against rapists. The United States Navy, too, is reluctant. The Navy received 24 reports of rape or sexual assault of students at the Orlando Naval Training Center between January 1989 and Jan June 1990. It failed to prosecute five of these cases and only one case resulted in a court martial law. Feminist experts on rape like Pauline Blart and Susan Brown Miller agree that rape is a conscious process of intimidation by which all men keep all women in a state of fear. Bart points out that since male sexual aggression is endemic, if any sex act against a person's will were considered rape, the majority of men would be rapists, adding, no, no man ever died of an erection, though many women have. Scully concludes, no fundamental change will occur until men are forced to admit that sexual violence is their problem. Yet while everyone knows that it is men who rape, few see it as men's problem. All too many women and men who do not rape blame women for rape, claiming that they deserve it, for putting themselves at risk. We will put aside the many cases that make a mockery of such statements, like 90-year-old women raped and killed in their own houses, to examine such a position. What are these people saying? They are assuming that men are women's natural enemies, much as one animal is another's that all men are potential predators upon women, and that women know this and must protect themselves. If they do not, they are asking for what they get. Men's behavior is taken for granted, not judged. Only women are judged, and what is taken for granted is that men are engaged in perpetual war against women. So automatic is society's acceptance of male rapists as a fact of life, that journalists often conceal this form of male predation. Peace activist Betty Reardon points out, that male-dominated media often censor the fact that murdered women were also raped. For example, the men who murdered the four American religiouses in El Salvador in 1980 raped them first, but most media did not mention this fact. One person who did, Reardon writes, was Mary Bader Papa in the National Catholic Report, who wrote, a special, 
A special message was sent us by the rapists and murderers of the four American women. They wanted to make it clear that women who step out of their place will find no special protection behind the labels of nun or church worker or even American. Furthermore, male peace activists ignore rape and other forms of male violence toward women in discussing violence in society. According to social scientist, peace activist, Birgit Brock Utney, citing a study that includes a list of peaceful societies, those in which violence against women is routine. She asks how a movement can call itself a peace movement and ignore male violence toward women. The dimensions of incest are not yet known. But what is becoming clear is that it is far more widespread than anyone had guessed. Incest is not class linked. Men of every class and education level rape little boys and girls. Girls, however, are the primary targets. Author Betsy Peterson's father, a highly respected, much loved physician, a surgeon, in private revealed his con contempt for his female patients. He also treated his wife contemptuously. He began to molest his daughter, massaging her clitoris to bring her to orgasm, or whatever a baby experiences when she was only three, lying in a crib. When her older half-sister came to live with the family, he molested her too, raping her when she reached 14 in Peterson's sight, saying he was making a woman out of her. Such men are not out of the ordinary. Psychologists have tested men in prison for rape and incest and find them normal. Bart, who finds rape a paradigm for male control in patriarchal societies, points out that there is little reason to believe that men who commit incest are mentally ill. She cites a study that concludes that incestuous fathers are neither psychotic nor intellectually defective, but are especially hostile toward women and see the sex act as an act of aggression. In patriarchal societies, one makes a woman of a girl and makes a man of a boy by the same method, humiliation and brutalization. But boys are humiliated by being treated as subordinates, females, Girls are humiliated by being taught that their, their own sexuality is not in their control. My own informal survey of adult women suggests that very few reach the age of 21 without suffering some form of male predation. Incest, molestation, rape or attempted rape, beatings, and sometimes torture or imprisonment. Other forms of violence become sex-linked because only women are their victims. For instance, in 1990, a man stalked the streets of Manhattan, shooting darts into women's buttocks. Most serial killers focus on females, especially prostitutes. Police tend not to pursue prostitutes' murderers energetically. Perhaps, like the Texas judge, who does not deem the murder of homosexuals or prostitutes a serious crime, they do not consider them human beings. In any case, the police themselves are part of an exclusive male club that routinely uses violence to maintain control. <laughs> Should I turn the light on? I like this light. But Mm. Whatever. When women are not available, men turn other males into women. So male prisoners regularly rape other male prisoners and many ministers and priests betray the trust of little boys or male teenagers by molesting them. The list could go on and on. I called these revelations the slime under the rug of patriarchy. We are hearing about it only now, but it has been there forever. In a collection of Spanish women's verse, some of the earliest poems dating from the 15th and 16th centuries are laments over incestuous fathers or brutal husbands. 
the most important accomplishment of the feminist movement, maybe the exposure of this secret, the hauling it out of the private darkness where it has flourished and hanging it out in the air for all to see. All patriarchists exalt the home and family as sacred, demanding it remain inviolate from prying eyes. Men want privacy for their violations of women. Women forced to be dependent upon men, educated to believe that men care for them and will take care of them, find that the very men they were taught to trust implicitly betray, brutal, brutalize, and violate them. All women learn in childhood that women are, as a sex are men's prey. Many also learn that men who supposedly cherish them are the worst offenders. They learn that love is about power and they are the powerless. The overwhelming majority of serial murderers are men. Female serial murderers often appear in films, but there are almost none in actuality. Most mass murders are committed by men as well, and many focus on women. Mark Lapine shot 14 female engineering students to death at the University of Montreal in December 1989. He then committed suicide, leaving a note. Even if the mad killer epithet will be attributed to me by media, I consider myself a rational, erudite man. Recently, on the same campus, another man bludgeoned a female engineering student on the head with a rock. She lived, he fled. Ms., which reported the event, found a silver lining. The tragedy had made people aware that women are engineers, raising enrollment at the school. But we must take Lapin seriously. He considered himself sane, erudite. He felt he had the right to kill women because they had taken his place in the school. Indeed, he ranted about feminists before his suicide. Like the pious Jews at the Wailing Wall who threw heavy metal chairs at women's heads and could easily have killed one. Like the pious Muslims who knifed women marching to protest the Ayatollah's decree on Purda. Like the pious Protestants who bomb abortion clinics. Like thousands of husbands, dates, fraternity boys, and strangers who beat or rape or kill women because they have decided women are the cause of their troubles like the rap musicians and comedians who spew hate at women. Mark Lapine felt he had the right to do what he chose to women. In personal and public life, in kitchen, bedroom, and halls of parliament, men wage unremitting war against women. We have examined discrimination against women in public spheres, in the workplace, the courts, and government agencies. We know that the effect of discrimination in the public sphere often leads to female and child impoverishment, starvation, and death. We know that everywhere women have lower status than men, less power, and more responsibility. Men start repressing females at birth. Only the means vary by society. They direct female babies to be selectively aborted, little girls to be neglected underfed, genitally mutilated, raped, or molested. They sell adolescent girls to men in marriage or slavery. Around all females swirls a culture pervaded by images of female sexual organs of female bodies being assaulted by men. The climate of violence against women harms all women. To be female is to walk the world in fear. On tests of fearfulness, the, le the least fearful women, the young, score the same level of fear as the most fearful men, the elderly. Women tend to lead stifling lives. They avoid going out alone after dark, even avoid even necessary tasks like errands or marketing in areas or at times when they feel at risk. But women are attacked at home too. Old women who draw the shades and lock their doors, young professionals, women of all ages and classes. The fact that most consistently correlates with fear of crime is femaleness. Women are afraid in a world in which almost half the population bears the guise of predator, in which no factor, age, dress, or color, distinguishes a man who will harm a woman from one who will, who will not. Wherever they are, women are always afraid of being, as rapists say, any woman, in the wrong place at the wrong time. 
and women's fear of bodily harm carries us full circle back to the abstract public sphere of politics, where it functions to motivate women to support the very political structures that oppress them. In The Iron Ladies, Why Do Women Vote Tory? Beatrix Campbell discusses the reasons why so many British women support the Conservative Party. Tory women have been the backbone of the Conservative Party organization. Their votes carry it to victory. Campbell points out that if the Tories had been forced to rely on the vote labor extracts from women, it would not have survived electorally, nor would it have been able to represent itself as the National Party. Labor presents itself as an egalitarian party, the Tories as anti-egalitarian. But the Labor Party was designed to represent organized labor, not working people generally. And by the 20th century, organized labor had eliminated women, defeated their demands for equal access to work and wages. The self-declared egalitarian policy party was firmly tied to a masculine eyesed political tradition, the choice that is now destroying it. While the wily party of privilege gave women a special place, created a culture that embraced women, that celebrated their subordination, when the Conservative Party modernized after World War II, it was faced with far more working class than leisure class voters and rapidly regrouped around women. Labor kept its loyal female following but failed to expand it, mainly because it dismissed working class women's demands for economic equality, even though women were making a huge contribution to an, e an uh, economy in crisis because of the war. The Conservatives did not support economic equality either, but promised to liberate the housewife. Resuscitating the ideology of separate sexual spheres, they assigned women responsibility for the domestic organization of the party. Women given a place of their own, which labor did not offer, thronged to the party, gaining enough lev leverage by the late 1950s to challenge the party's leadership with their own agenda. What Campbell calls the party's women's agenda associated women with an emerging new right, an anti-modernist axis, which became Thatcherism and was expressed almost entirely in the language of moral authoritarianism and law and order. Women's fear, writes Campbell, provided the emotional ignition for the law and order debates. While male party leaders watched in bewildered silence, women, terrified by a new level of violence that became endemic in the UK after the war, pres pressured the party to legislate their safety. If safety required separate spheres, like separate subway cars, so be it. It was largely the willingness of the Tories to include law and order in their agenda that accounts for the fact that historically more men than women supported the Labour Party and more women than men supported the Conservative Party. Yet conservative women are no fools. Pessimistic about the likelihood that politics will improve women's lives. Strong yet subordinate. They remain idealistic only about the power of women in their own sphere. Campbell finds a contradiction at the center of British conservatism. The party provides a space inhabited by a strong feminine presence and yet is one of the institutions which structures women's subordination as a sex and supports the class and gender power of men. Even women's ostensible friends are their enemies at heart. While men strut and fret their hour upon the stage, shout in bars and sports arenas, thump their chests or show their profiles in the legislatures, and explode incredible weapons in an endless contest for status, an obsessive quest for symbolic proof of their superiority. Women quietly keep the world going. Women know that men will not do this. They, they do the job or it will not be done. They grow or buy. They carry and prepare food for the essential, inevitable, necessarily female prepared dinner. They give birth to the children and feed them and bathe them and hold them and teach them and hope they will survive. They encourage their men, nurture them, soothe them, nag them, hoping they too will survive and help the children to survive. 
They do not, as a caste, want the same things men want, and so different are the motivations driving the two sex What do women want? What? What? I was curious. Women know what men want, but they too shake their heads. Women are not selfless saints. They kill, they have been known to torture and torment. They abuse others and themselves, fight, injure, are cruel. Women have egos, selves, desires for themselves. No human emotion is alien to women, and there is no human behavior they are not capable of, except thrusting a penis that is naturally attached to their bodies into an opening. In this sense, they are less limited than men, who cannot menstruate, get pregnant, give birth, feed a baby from their bodies, or accept a penile object in a vagina. Women may not be identified as mothers, for not all women are or want to be mothers. But women as a caste behave as they do, because most are mothers. And because women are mothers and men are not, men feel lacking without a center, it seems not to occur to most men that they can, like women, find their center in children. In future generations, focuses on maintaining the human race. Men seem unable to find, feel equal to women. They must be superior or they are inferior. They seek a center in other men and male solidarity through male cults in simple societies, priesthoods, military or paramilitary groups, academies, professions, teams, religious brotherhoods, or the new male cults. All of these exalt not men as a caste, but group members, posited as superior to most other men and all women. All such priesthoods teach xenophobia, hatred of strangers, and bigotry. All exalt some form of self-denial, austerity in living, denial of feelings or need, and all worship aggression and violence because all worship domination. Only the ability to dominate others makes them superior to women. And superiority to women is the very foundation of this kind of male identity. Violence is an easy response to fear. It is also simple-minded. For the men who rule society to inculcate and foster violence in dominant males is to educate them to be truly inferior human beings. Some women today believe that men are well on their way to exterminating women from the world through violent behavior and oppressive policies. Medieval clerics used to question why their god had invented women at all, concluding sadly that women were necessary for procreation. Now, new reproductive technologies can make women obsolete and the laboratory will become a new locus of violence against women. But so extreme is this world view, worldwide multi-leveled assault on women that people are uniting against it. Men are joining together to discuss their own sense of identity. These groups are still small and scattered, but more men are beginning to realize that male supremacy may work to their practical advantage, but stunts them emotionally, and that this emotional damage affects everything thought processes, lifespan, health, relationships, the entire quality of a life. Some groups like Robert Bly's male gatherings seem to exalt the very qualities that are the problem, but others seek a new definition of manhood. Women's fight against male oppression is global and richly varied. Women everywhere are joining together in grassroots economic projects or building clinics or schools. Such projects benefit entire communities. Women everywhere are agitating against male violence toward women, and founding formal groups to fight for fair laws, political representation, education, and economic justice for women. Feminists are producing an original, impressive body of scholarly work that provides a foundation for future society and alternatives to patriarchal structures. Our Bodies, Ourselves, produced by the Boston Women's Health Collective and widely translated, revolutionized women's way of caring for themselves. Women in Kenya adopted a holistic approach to health, self-esteem, and race sex oppression developed by the Black Women's Health Network in Atlanta. For over a decade, the Women's Health Clinic in Geneva, Dispensaire des Femmes, has offered non-medical feminist health care using Western and herbal treatments and trained women who have established similar clinics in Costa Rica, Brazil, Nicaragua, and India. Feminist groups like Gabriella in the Philippines and the Women's Information Center in Thailand help victims of forced prostitution in their countries and educate young women 
about the dangers of believing deceitful ads offering jobs abroad. They also denounced their governments for complicity in sex tourism, which brings in foreign capital and is sometimes officially included in the budget for national development plans. A global business it requires global action, and feminists from Japan, Thailand, Korea, and the Philippines worked the crowd at the International Tourism Conference in Manila in 1982, holding demonstrations there and at national airports, embarrassing everyone involved. Women in Waianae, Hawaii, which has one of the highest unemployment rates in the state, organized to deal with male domestic violence. Reali realizing the heightened level of violence was connected to the political situation, they decided to work for political change in their community. Among their programs was one called Peace Education, which is now offered in most YNI public schools. The two-week curriculum teaches students to examine their anger and violent behavior and ways to create harmony in the family. The group holds health seminars for women and girls and drew up a grant proposal for a women's handicraft cooperative to enable them to earn money in cottage industries. The YNI women also worked for nuclear disarmament and made a film to promote it. Only six pages left. I don't know if I can make it. Indian women formed Vimochana to help battered women get police or legal help. But as the organization grew, it expanded to offer consciousness raising groups to help women deal with male violence and practical help with harassment over dowries or bigamous husbands who abandoned families without support. It organizes women in slums, industries, and working women's hostels around issues of oppression and discrimination. Vimochana work women also join peasant and workers associations, which they sometimes lead in actions and work in the peace movement. Feminists founded Development Alternatives with Women for a New Era, an organization, or, an international organization based in India that connects third world women activists, researchers, and policymakers to develop a global perspective on women's economic and political situation. Dawn's workshops and panels at U.S. women's conferences have influenced third world women delegates to defy their governments and openly criticize oppressive social and political practices, including clitoridectomy. In 1984, women from 24 African countries held a conference in the Sudan. African women speak on female circumcision and issued a report advocating the total eradication of genital mutilation of women. Women in Brazilian shanty towns told Dawn workers their main problem was reproduction. The Brazilian left, campaigning against population control, had printed a flyer showing a man on television offering women birth control pills and the woman responding by demanding resources, not pills. The women of Sao Paulo said this falsely represented them. They wanted both. Dawn formed Proyecto Eso Sexo Que Inoso, Project for This Sex That Is Ours, which produced a series of simple illustrated booklets describing basic aspects of women's health, reproduction, and sexual pleasure. The most effective educational materials for poor women available in Brazil, they are now distributed by the government. Noting that 44% of Nicaraguan men regularly beat their wives or lovers, the Nicaraguan Women's Association launched a campaign to condemn male violence. Since Brazilian women hesitate to report abuse to policemen, who tend to treat them as criminals, the Sao Paulo State Council for Women's Rights introduced all-female staffed police stations in 1984. The initiative was so successful that 70 similar stations were opened across Brazil to deal with complaints of rape and domestic violence. For over a decade, Brazilian feminists campaigned to end legally sanctioned wife murder. Men could murder wives, even those who had left them, and claim a legitimate defense of honor on grounds that women had been unfaithful. In 1980-81 alone, 722 men in Sao Paulo State used this defense to win acquittal for wife murder. A campaign leader explained, in the interior of the country, it is easier and cheaper for a man to hire a gunslinger to kill his wife than to get a divorce and then and to separate the property. 
feminist pressure and dissemination of information on such crimes won a victory for women in March 1991, when the Brazilian Supreme Court disallowed this defense. Women attorneys started the Uganda Association of Women Lawyers and, and a Women's Legal Aid Clinic to help uneducated poor women. 80% of the Ugandan population is illiterate. Many people are unaware of Ugandan laws, and women especially are caught in the intersection of tradition and modern laws. Women married in traditional fashion do not know that they are not legally married and have no protection if their husbands die. Men's families often take all their possessions, leaving their widows. Men often marry more than one wife and children destitute. Clinic lawyers go out into the countryside and sit on the grass talking to women. They teach rural women that wife beating is illegal, help widows claim part of their husband's estate, and help women left by their husbands, who are then denied jobs on the ground that those who cannot manage their own homes cannot manage anything else. When the Manuela Ramos movement, women's center in the slums of Lima, Peru, began offering courses, Women asked to learn about sexuality, health, and birth control. The center held workshops to discuss women's lives on personal, informational, and organizational levels. In the first, women learned about their bodies, their sexuality, and their roles as human beings, mothers, and citizens. The informational workshop responds to women's questions about health, primary education, and neighborhood organization. For organizational sessions, the center sketches projects. The women could initiate, like running child care centers, eating places, or training programs. A Lima slum woman left her house to community women when she died for their use as a shelter from battering. Women in Peruvian shanty towns have taken to carrying whistles, which they blow if they are beaten or attacked. A whistle blown immediately draws a crowd of women ready to defend the victim. Southeast Asian women organize projects to help victims of battery and rape and to change rape laws and community attitudes. Indian women bang pots and pans outside the houses of men most abusive to their wives. Feminist groups like Sahili agita agitate against widespread dowry deaths and have forced passage of a law requiring any accidental death or suicide of a woman in the first seven years of her marriage to be investigated for possible foul play. In Nigeria, girls are married between 11 and 13 and may be genitally, genitally mutilated and often have agonized childbirths. Obstructed birth can tear a hole between the vaginal canal and the bladder that, without corrective surgery, renders a girl incontinent for life. 20,000 women, mainly Muslims, in northern Nigeria suffered from this damage. F, uh, VVF vesico -va vaginal fistula. Their husbands divorced them and families shunned them. Publicity galvanized Nigerian feminists to mount a campaign against early marriage. African-American Mildred Tludi and Mexican-American Maria Fava work separately to improve living conditions and reduce racial enmity in the Williamsburg-Greenpoint neighborhood of Brooklyn. They force the city to take some necessary steps in the process introducing low-income women to feminism and enriching their own lives. White women join black women to fight against the Ku Klux Klan in many localities. Women lead citizens groups to oppose nuclear power and are the most committed and energetic agitators and the majority of leaders of community efforts to deal with toxic waste in Chicago and other cities. In industrial societies, women are slotted into office work that often pays less than factory work. Women who may be as well educated as their male bosses are confined to a female occupation that allows men to treat them like servants. Women in banking and insurance companies in Cleveland, Boston, and Washington, D.C. organized to deal with sex discrimination and poor treatment in offices. At first, organizers formed groups piecemeal to negotiate solutions. When this proved unsatisfactory, they affiliated with the Service Employees International Union as 9 to 5. The National Association of Working Women. The film 9 to 5 inspired women across the country to form similar independent groups like Women Employed and Working Women. Chilean women endured pressure hoses, spewing garbage and risk imprisonment, as did Argentinian women, to demand return of their desaparecidos, disappeared ones, and help bring down authoritarian military governments in both countries. Chilean women made and smuggled arpilleras out of the country. These embroidered or appliqued tapestries used pictures to inform the world about tor torture, murder, and starvation in Chile. Soviet women dared to defy a dicta dictatorial government by demanding information on murdered soldier sons. Korean women regularly mount protests in the name of children murdered by the tyrannical South Korean regime. Women, anxious about the arms race between the United States and the Soviet Union, mounted Women's Strike for Peace, WSP, in 1961, a grassroots effort organized by informal networking. 
the House Committee on Un-American Activities, designed to suppress the dissent, saw peace movements as dissent, as the government still does, and summoned some WSP women for interrogation. The women's non-hierarchical organizing methods generated a huge successful action and also protected them from political persecution because there were no designated leaders and they kept no written li lists of members. Determined not to hold internal purges or cower before the committee, WSP members volunteered to talk instead of refusing to testify, like 1950s radicals and civil liberta libertarians. About a hundred women telegraphed the HUAC chairman, offering to come to Washington to talk about the movement. The offers were refused. The original WSP tactic revealed the committee's real intent to expose and smear those it investigated, not to get information. The typical newspaper account read, the dreaded House Un-American Activities Committee met in Waterloo this week. It, un it tangled with 500 irate women. They laughed at it. Klieg lights glared, television cameras whirred, and 50 reporters scribbled notes while babies cried and cooed during the fantastic inquisition. When the first woman headed to the witness table, the crowd rose silently to its feet. The irritated Chairman Clyde Doyle of California outlawed standing. They applauded the next witness, and Doyle outlawed clapping. Then they took to running out to kiss the witness. Finally, each woman, as she was called, was met and handed a huge bouquet. By then, Doyle was a beaten man. By the third day, the crowd was giving standing ovations to the heroines with impunity. The WSP women ended HUAC's effectiveness and helped influence President Kennedy to sign the Limited Test Ban Treaty of 1963. In 1980, the first women's Pentagon action, 2,000 women, circled the Pentagon, declaring to the world, that militarism was sexism. Their powerful expression of feminist anti-militarism inspired women elsewhere, such as the Greenham Common. In 1979, in a broad intensification of the nuclear arms race, NATO announced plans to place hundreds of American nuclear missiles in Western Europe. First to be installed in 1983 were 96 ground-launched cruise missiles in the U.S. air base at Greenham Common near Newbury, about 60 miles west of London. In September 1981, 40 British women walked 120 miles from Wales to Greenham Common to protest and publicize this use of British soil. The media ignored them, so the women decided to remain until the public grew aware of the American strategy to use Europe as a shield against the Eastern Bloc to keep war from American soil. The Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp developed from this vigil outside the gates of the base. The women, many with children, put up tents and settled in. The small stubborn group grew on grew, and on December 11, 1982, 20,000 women formed a 19-mile human chain, a nine-mile, around the base. That's a lot, though. They redecorated the site, adorning the barbed wire fence with thousands of bits of fabric, poems, children's pictures, toys, and other personal treasures. The protesters' original aim was to open public debate on the new nuclear weapons, but as more and more women joined the effort, and the protests started receiving international attention, they shifted their goal to blocking the deployment of missiles at Greenham. Both governments ignored them, and missiles arrived at the base in November 1983. But the women remained, keeping a permanent vigil to protest the missiles and all nuclear weapons. The number of women actually camping out at Greenham has varied over time, but they have continued day and night in all seasons, and sun or rain, mostly rain in that part of England. They are still there, if not in the same numbers. Actions involving up to 50,000 women at a time have been held at the base every year since the camp began. The protests propelled huge numbers of women across Britain into peace activism and inspired women to build peace encampments at over a hundred sites. Molesworth, England, Comiso, Italy, Hunstruck, Germany, Nanus, Canada, Seneca in Puget Sound in the United States, Soisterberg, Holland, Pine Gap, Australia. Shibokusa women have protested American troops occupying Japan since the 1950s. Feminists have mounted anti-militarist actions in the United States, Britain, Germany, the South Pacific, New Zealand, and Eastern Europe. Actions that are not isolated process but tied to a global network. Greenham Common Women affirm solidarity with women in American peace camps. Women in the American peace movement held a dialogue in San Francisco with women from Japan, the Marshall Islands, and Latin America in 1983. In 1984, thousands of New Zealand women marched in support of the Greenham Common Women. Among them were women from the movement for Maori self-determination, marching against militarism, and for Maori land rights.
Women infused the peace movement with new vitality. After millennia of more male war against them, women are fighting back on every front.